Great. Perfect. All right. Um, so I am Angelica Sule, I'm curator at Site Gallery and I'm kind of hosting and mediating this conversation. Um, this is the second session of Site Salons we've done. Um, and Site Salons has been created to kind of have a space of conversation between artists and art practitioners, um, but also with our audiences and our viewers as well. Um, a few kind of housekeeping things at the top of this is if you're not speaking, if you can please keep yourself on mute, just so we don't have noises going on in other places. Um, we're going to start the conversation with Nuanda and Nathan, but um, we'll open that out and we'd really like for everyone to be involved and contribute to that. If you have a question or a comment, if you can put your hand up or write something into the chat and I'll make sure to interject and try and keep track of what everyone wants to say. Um, so I'm gonna introduce a little bit of what this session will be about. Um, I'm gonna do a screen share so that everyone can see what I'm saying. Um, Shana is gonna come in and she's gonna caption this, uh, this session shortly, but she's been stuck in another meeting. Um, so until we can do that, I'm going to just share some of the text that I'm reading from. So let's do this. Yeah. Okay. Can everybody see uh, my screen, which has the site gallery website on it? Yeah. Great. Okay. So. This particular site salon session is with Nwando Obizi and Nathan Gearing. Um, and it's an open conversation centered around definitions of accessibility in its broadest sense and the ways in which it can be utilized to enhance our collective creative practices. Uh, Nwando and Nathan will investigate how accessibility can benefit both disabled and non-disabled artists and audiences. And as a little introduction to the two artists, uh, Nuando Obizi is a constellation point for a spectrum of multidisciplinary works that call for radical change. She challenges her audience to question their perceived realities through art, personas, experimental theatre, neuroscience, music and African diasporic ritualistic dance. Carving out her own particular strand of Afrofuturism, she combines research into the neuroscience of perception inspired by her own neurodiversity and an obsession with science fiction with a ritualistic live art practice. Nathan Gearing is an artistic, is the artistic director for Rational Theatre Company and has been pioneering research into the unlikely link between hip hop and visual impairment. In 2015, Nathan became a fellow for ADAD's Trailblazers programme. This enabled him to begin to conduct academic research surrounding visibility of dance forms to people with visual impairment. His company have also enhanced accessibility by reinventing audio description, combining beatboxing, poetry and motive text to provide a richer soundscape for people with visual impairment. He continues to implement his worth both work both nationally and internationally to bridge the gap between disabled and non-disabled artists and audiences the world over. Um, so just gonna let Shana in so that she can do some um, captioning. So I'm gonna stop my share just for a minute so I can set Shana up as a co-host so that she can start to caption here we go make co-host all right um and then if it's okay i'm going to hand over to nwando and nathan and yeah please put your hands up or comment in the chat and i'll keep an eye on when people want to interject or make comments all right thanks Thank you. Hey. <laughs> hey, 
Hey, everybody. Hi. Hey, uh, hey Nathan. <laughs> Hi, everybody. How you all doing? You all good? Wicked. Okay, well, I uh, just want to say uh, thank you so much for joining in with our, our, our talk today. Um, I'm really excited about, about this talk uh, because I feel, I feel like from this, we're going to be able to basically, um, well, just share our insights really on, on what our practices are and in terms of, you know, how we can enhance accessibility and, you know, we can help inform each other's practice on how we can enhance accessibility uh, for both disabled and non-disabled artists and audiences. Um, so I think maybe Nwando, maybe we should start off with the first um, question, which- oh, could, I, could I just start off with, a, I'll, I'll just say a few words. Yeah, go for it, go for it. Cool. Just to say, my name's Wando and, um, and I, um, I will need to move around during this and I also invite if other people need to move around, if you need to have your screen off, just feel comfortable to do that. Um, um, we're going to start with questions um, that Nathan, Nathan's posed some questions and I was a bit naughty and I didn't post my questions to Nathan in advance um, but I, I'm going to be asking Nathan lots of questions as well. Um, I'm doing this in the wrong order. Yeah, um, I'm she, her, I am wearing a black um, kind of polo neck and I have black hair and um, there was one more thing and we'll have a little comfort break like halfway through this session um, yeah those are the things I wanted to say I think. Yeah. okay yeah so um, following on from that I'm Nathan Gearing um, pronouns are he or him I am a person of mixed race colour I'm six foot one I have a uh, thick curly afro hair with a, a thick beard with the same texture if you were to run your hands through it the sound it would probably make is in terms of the texture would be kind of like a Ooh. kind of um feel to it as well um i'm wearing a gray uh hoodie which has a, a rationale method logo on which is a uh, red and white and um, the hoodie again is a fairly smooth material for a hoodie so it'd be more kind of, shh, kind of feel to it um, so yeah, that just gives you, I guess, a little bit of a, a flavour in terms of my, my appearance as well. Um, do you want to start, should we start with the questions now, Wando? Yeah, let's start with the questions. Okay, wicked. All right, um, so I guess the, the, first, the first question um, I posed to both of us is, uh, what is accessibility in its broadest sense? What, uh, what, is, what does that, what does that mean, mean to you? Uh, shall I go first? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I... <laughs> mm. Accessibility is about making sure at every level that things are accessible. Um, I, I tend to follow the social model of disability. It's imperfect but it's a good model to start from which states that one isn't inherently disabled one is disabled by society um, and if adaptations are made and assumptions are removed then then that individual is no longer disabled um, so it's about making the world more accessible for everybody. It's about making the world more accessible for the marginalised in in, a, in the widest possible sense. Yeah, that's my feelings today at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd just like to, to echo that as, as well. Um, I think um, for me, accessibility, um, you know, is not just about, um, you know, people with, with, with disabilities gaining access to, for example, certain areas and certain spaces and, and things and access to art and stuff, but it's also people from different um, social economic backgrounds and, and classes and things. Um, you know, so for example, I mean, 
if you were to look at again if you look at for example the, the black lives matter movement that's that's come up you know a lot of that you know is born out of a lot of um people of color feeling like they don't have you know access to for example certain levels of senior management and, and things like that within certain institutions and organizations um and so yeah there's you know accessibility issues that that need to be addressed there um as well so it's it's not um only within the realm of disability but it's also in the realm of like um you know social economic and background and, and class and you know and, and, and even even beyond that as, as well can i just can i can i pick up on something go for it um which is so we we chatted before and and we talked about this a little bit before as well but i noticed it just in, in almost like you know, straight away one of the things you said is that we have a point of difference with the way we um express ourselves in in regards to disability mm -hmm. i think it's quite interesting and useful um to talk about um so i'm I'm disabled and I'm autistic and I also have a neurological syndrome called visual snow, um, which is a perceptual disorder um, and it affects um, vision, hearing, um, somatic sensation, a, a touch feeling, um, psychological things and I have mental health issues. Um, and so I, I consider myself neurodivergent and um, I, I use, um, so there's, so language is really important to me and I get very, um, uh, fi fixed on it. Things don't make sense when things aren't quite right. But, um, so you said, um, people with disabilities yep. and I say disabled people. Yeah. Um, and I wondered if you could, yeah, if you could elaborate. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. So obviously, so I, myself, um, I'm not a person with a disability. I, I have worked with people with disabilities for coming up for nearly 20 years now. And like a lot of the people um, with disabilities I work with, um, because obviously I've asked, I've asked that question, you know, how, how would you like to, to be referred to? And the majority of people that, you know, I've, I've worked with and I've come across, you know, they, they prefer um, to be regarded as people with disabilities, so a person first, mm. because it's not the disability that that you know that defines them so they they feel it should be you know they're a person first and foremost um and you know then you obviously you know they just so happen to ha to have a disability so hence why that's the that's the reason why i use the the terminology in in, in the way in which i way which i do which again um i guess kind of you know fits within um the social model that you were talking about mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, with you know, within within the the, the, so, the social model, it's not a case of that that person is disabled. It's because of society has, has um, you know how society is structured is what is what has actually been, um, I guess, the defining factor in you know in a person you know being seen to have a disability. Um, and yeah, and for me, I think I think one thing it points to is the fact that you've worked so you've worked with disabled people for over 20 years and you've you've asked that question and you check check in and i think that's the thing there's no there's not a monolith on this the different people will feel differently about it and it's always worth checking in with that um i guess for me it's i'm not super good at uh, expressing this, I worked with a deaf artist recently who was, who was much better than me at, at talking about this, but I guess for, for her, she, she was deaf, she was born deaf, she's in deaf culture. The deafness isn't the disability, the deafness is a part of her. Mm -hmm. The disability is the fact that not enough people are taught sign language, um, even deaf people as, as standard now when they go to school they're not taught sign language this idea that you're meant to lip read um adaptations not being made for people in in public spaces in social spaces in workspaces so it's it's i guess it's kind of removing the negativity away from the thing like like being deaf like being autistic 
but it's it's a spectrum of of ideas about it and and beliefs mm. yeah definitely and like i, th I think I, I find again with like terminologies and things again it, c it can be quite fluid in terms of you know over time mm -hmm. for example, if you look at for example political correctness even around um skin color you know for a long time you know it was like okay that's a black person and then all of a sudden it wasn't politically correct to say oh, you know that's a black person people were saying oh they're colored and then it kind of like swung you know swings back the other way so again it's it, it's something that's fluid and you know i think what the most important thing is is like the person that you're talking to you yeah. know you connect with them on that level and you find out okay well what is it that you know they they prefer to be um, re referred to as or what kind of terms of references and you can only get that understanding through dialogue and conversation rather than thinking oh I, I you know i know it all and, and stuff like that or i'm or i'm too afraid to ask those questions it's like these questions need to be asked so then we can get past this point and get to the meat of things and you know and talk about you know the things that you know we really want to be talking about and I guess the other thing it's the um so the, there's this this phrase which I'm sure some people will know is it's nothing with us without us and the point is that if you don't have people in the decision making levels of things whether that's people of colour, disabled people, people of, of of different genders and gender minorities then then it's like those conversations don't get kind of had and settled and then things don't don't move on well. So I don't know, for something something like the idea of, of coloured, I'm pretty sure there were no black people in any rooms when they decided that that was the thing to call people. So it's like it was politically correct, but I'm pretty sure we weren't consulted. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. that's the I guess that's the that's the idea, isn't it? That that's the importance of accessibility is to also improve diversity for, for, for good reasons, not as a kind of exercise in tick boxing, but to progress things on. Yeah, and that's you know, and that's you know, one one of the most important elements of access is whoever it is that you're wanting to provide access for, you need to be in consultation with those people, you need to be talking to those people. You know, it it, it shouldn't be a case of, oh, I think they may like this so that yeah. it, you know even if you may have an idea you still you still need to consult um with, with the people that you're you're actually trying to, to to help and to help benefit from there because to be honest they'll come up with like better ideas than you'll have because it's their direct lived experience and things and they'll and like the ideas that they'll come up with will will it only enhance everything that you're trying to do because they're talking from their a, a direct lived experience yep <laughs> yeah there'll be lots of there'll be some points of difference there'll be lots of agreeing and going like yay <laughs> in this conversation I'm sure. yeah wicked okay um so should we move on to the, the next question then mm -hmm. all right okay so how do you embed accessibility into into your practice um so for me it's it's so i think Working with ideas around accessibility is a journey and you're never finished. I think that's really important to understand and accept. Um, for me, over the last few years, what I've understood is that it's, it's at the beginning, it's inseparable from the initial creative spark. I don't, I, at, the, at the moment, I don't have ideas and then go, how can I make that more accessible? I have ideas and it's all it's all just kind of bound up within it um, and I think that thinking about accessibility doesn't feel like an imposition I think that's the important thing it feels like it's inherently innovative it makes my work more innovative it makes my work more creative um, also because of the type of work I do, which is always about ritual and communion and bringing people together. Um, there's no way that there can be any idea of, like it's, it's like, it's nonsensical to, to think, to, to make something that doesn't try to bring the most marginalized people together, the most kind of like broadest kind of like sphere of people together. Um, yeah, that's, I guess that's, 
that's the, the base layer, I guess. I think the other important thing about how I embed accessibility into my practice is that I try to understand my own access needs. Um, that was that was when I started thinking about accessibility. It was when I started to realise what I needed and what was missing from my practice in my life and from my collaborations. And once I started realising that, it just made me, it just opened my eyes to, gosh, well, what about everybody else? What, like, how, how to make it as accessible as possible? And there was, there, there was and is, I'm sure there will be lots of failures along the way, um, because accessibility is so broad and it's, and it develops. Um, so I think the other point is to keep, um, to never think the work's done. Like I think for me, it's important to just keep open to hearing more and reading more and researching more and listening more about how to improve access within my own work. Wicked. How about you? Um, with me, um, so my so my 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 level of expertise is. Um, within um, vision impairment. That's, so that's, that's where my, my main focus is. And I think at this moment in time, that is because they take, there's so much detail that needs to go into, you know, trying to make something fully accessible, um, just, with, just within, within that realm, that I, I guess I kind of, I, I'm sticking to, to what I know at this, at this moment in time. I say, I say this, but we're actually, just looking at doing some really exciting stuff with captioning, but I'll, I'll talk about that that later. Um, but like, so it, it's kind of like, like when I like when I spoke to um, some people with disabilities, they they talk about this thing called crip time. I don't know if anybody's heard of it, which is is basically if you wanted to make things accessible, you need to add a lot more time than if you were to make something accessible. So because it can take quite a lot of time to to think about um you know for example even just audio description uh, for, um so typically if you were to audio describe a um a production say like an hour hour long theatrical production you're looking at about anywhere between 30 to 50 hours of preparation that just goes that just goes in into that um because obviously with a lot of complex movements that's happening you then have to be able to describe the you know the angle the speed what in relation the emotional intention everything to write all that stuff down and then to practice it to make sure that you've got it in times you know that takes a, a hell of a hell of a lot of time um so that's why for example my my focus has, has been within that it's kind of like i want to get that on lockdown before i kind of like you know turn my full attention to to other genres but what that means is I then look to other people who have expertise within other realms. So for example, you know, I, you know, within the last production we made, we, we worked with um, a deaf director um, and a, and a BSL interp interpreter um, just, just to work on those elements. When I was the artistic director for the special Olympics, um, we worked with a lot of, um, you know, groups that worked with, with people, for example, who, had autism or who had a Down syndrome, you know, and, and other neurological differences as well. So it was, you know, so it's a case of making sure that you, when you work with these other organizations, these other experts, that you give them enough time to be able to, um, to, I guess, to do the accessibility justice. Because a lot of time, for example, if I talk from my own experience, um with doing audio description if we're brought in as an add-on at mm. the end what can what can happen is it can the audio description won't have enough time to breathe in the art that's created um and and i mean that because for example our audio description is linear so it, you can only des describe a certain amount of movements in a certain set of time because of the words that it takes so if you haven't if you haven't allowed enough time, so for example, in if you're making a, a film or if you're making a you know a, a piece of, of live art or live action, if you haven't left enough time within that, things are going to have to be sacrificed. Um, 
in, ter in, ter in terms of the access. And so what can happen is the audio description can feel like it's shooed in. And sometimes you feel like it's been speaking, people are speaking really, really quickly in order to try and get things in. Um, and again, that, you know, that can be counterproductive um, to what it is that you're trying to achieve. So make sure, so what I try to do is I try to make sure that whatever level of exit, um, whatever um, type of accessibility I'm, I'm wanting to address, I try and make sure there's enough, there's enough time in order to prepare for that. And that's why, again, like Wando, I always try and make sure that when I'm embedding accessibility, I think about it right from its inception um, and then think about how, how we can you know, move forward with, within that. Um, when we work, when my company, when we work with other organizations, we'll, we'll work with the artists, again, hopefully right from the earliest stage possible because we need to get an understanding of, okay, what is the ethos um, of what it is that you're trying to create? You know, what, you know, is there a message that you're wanting to, to, to express? I know a lot of artists can be like, oh, well, it can mean anything you want it to mean. But also if there is a, um, I guess, a, a basic level of communication that you want in your art to, to convey, you know, we, we like to know that as well, because then that will also influence, for example, the language that we use, you know, that will, you know, influence the, um, the, the vocal delivery, you know, the dynamics of delivery, whether it's done in a very posh accent or where it's done with something that's a little bit more grime, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, so it's, it's got to be, it's got to be done from as early as possible so we can have those conversations with our clients, just so we can ensure that we're representing their art as best we can, because with, with, the audio description for me it's just another it's just another um means of communication and translation of artistic expression and i i view it as art as well it's an art in its own right it's an art form in, in its own right so it's not just something that's functional mm -hmm. um you know to serve a purpose of accessibility it's like you know i mean the reason our method of audio description came about was because we were talking to a lot of people with visual impairment and they said that they just found the current provision of audio description just not engaging enough really you know it was very kind of like bland and almost like robotic and things and so yeah we just we just started we just we just we just listened to what the people wanted really and that's why we we created the the, the techniques that we do and our aesthetic the aesthetics that we have and they can be very different to what people are used to with audio description but in terms of engaging audiences, you know, we, we find that, it, you know, it really, it really does engage. But that's only because we, we've listened to, you know, to the, to the people that we're trying to provide the access for. You know, so everything we do is in cons consultation with people with visual impairment. Every time we're providing audio description for an organization, we have a group of people with visual impairment that are our consultants. So we'll, we'll check in at certain stages of the production process and we're like, okay, how is this language that we're using? How is this um, certain text? You know, how is the um, vocal delivery? Is it dynamic enough? Does it need more? Does it need less? And they'll come back and they'll be like, yeah, that's great. Or actually, no, Nathan, you're, you're way off on that. Or can you be a bit more specific within that? And then so we help, and that can help us mold and shape um, our audio description service in a, in a way that is suitable while still trying to maintain the, um, I guess, the energy and the ethos of, the um the artist or the client that we're working with um nathan do you want to share any videos at this point of like examples of the audio uh, description yeah yeah sure so um i guess what we'll what we can do is if we start off with um yeah we'll start off with uh the rationale method of audio description is the first one so this was for bbc breakfast um right. they did I'm a, gonna share screen yeah they did a feature on us when we were working with the royal opera house so basically what had happened with within this just to give you guys a bit of context was um we were working with the royal opera house where we were actually um teaching people with vision impairment their like break-in or as the commercial public knows as breakdance as a means of injury prevention and to improve spatial awareness. So basically we were teaching people with visual impairment a life skill <laughs> from breakdancing because a lot of people with visual impairment fall and get injured and breaking is just known as falling with style. So we were basically teaching them how to, how to fall mm -hmm. safe. And part of the way that I was teaching that was using the rationale method of audio description. So we were using beatboxing sound effects 
in order to help um, convey certain movements. And yeah, so we then utilize those same sound effects to audio describe the performance we did at the Royal Opera House as well. Um, but yeah, so this will give you just a little bit of a, a, a flavor in, into things. Great. Sweeping his arms through the air, dipping and swooping across the space with balletic movement. Audio description for dance has completely revolutionized dance for visually impaired audiences. It's brought people in and it's allowed people who've had late onset um, sight loss to, to re-engage with theatre, re-engage with dance. How we've done it is we've gotten people with visual impairment to physicalise each sound effect beatboxers make. So, for example, if the majority of people with visual impairment are saying that there's a sound effect for a jump, we'll always use that sound effect for a jump. If they're saying that there's a sound effect for a spin, we'll always use that sound effect for a spin. Because what our research has also found that certain sound effects can heighten accessibility, but certain sound effects can hinder accessibility. So it's not like anybody just off the street can be like, do you know what, I'm just going to make a bunch of sounds and start to audio describe some things. It's, it's a lot more deeper than that. But we spent yeah, the last six years um, pretty much developing this unique method of audio description. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I guess it pretty much um, says what it what it does on the team with that. And like within within the audio description as well, it's like we you know we we have to give some descriptive text as well. And the reason is because if it's just sound by itself, then you know there's no context to it. But like you know, once you add so, for example, something like a the dancer slices through the air, it's like. You get you get an idea of like you know the speed and angle and the idea that actually okay that's the the hand movement that's slicing through the air um, rather than it being like you know cause it could be a leg slicing through the air for or somebody you knows so you have to give certain words in order to to give context but the majority of it is um, is described through through sound effects other but that's not the only um, the only aesthetic that we do so I mean as you can see like even though the sound effects come from beatboxing it doesn't mean that it has a hip hop feel to it. So it's not something like, boom, 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 choo, choo. It's, it's nothing like that. It's just literally just taking the, the individual sound effects that's needed to, to help enhance, um, to help enhance a, mo a movement. Um, but we have, we have um, different aesthetics. So basically how we ended up developing the audio description, we not only worked with um, people with visual impairment, but we also worked with audio describers who were trained in the conventional methods of audio description. So we worked with audio describers that, you know, had worked, I don't know, within audio description for like six years and things. And what we, what we did was, because basically when we, when we spoke to a lot of audio describers, they were trained to deliver audio description in a certain way. Um, but they also felt like there's certain things that could be done that, they're just not normally allowed to do or normally allowed to explore experiment with because obviously if they've been commissioned to do um to audio describe a piece of work they're normally expected to do it of a certain standard or to have a certain aesthetic so they don't really have the space to explore so i got i got some funding together and i basically created a safe space for these audio describers to basically be able to play and explore so i was like okay well you know what's right with audio description you also know what's wrong with it so let me know what are the elements that you feel absolutely have to stay from conventional audio description, but also let me know on what other elements you want to explore within audio description. And so, yeah, that's, that's what we, we did. And that's why we came up with uh, the poetic and subjective and emotive um, elements of audio description. So we can have audio description that, for example, has, um, you know, poetry, um, we have audio description that um, can have like a lot of metaphor attached to it and things. Um, and even just audio description that, free, that pretty much is, you know, does what it says on the tin. That's just subjective. So like conventionally audio description has, has been something that's been objective. And that is because, you know, is, is believed for a long time that, okay, all the audio description is there to do is just to provide the information. It's up to the person who um, is, is visually impaired to basically um, decide, you know, what, what that means. But the problem within that is, like I said before, audio description is linear. 
So it can take a long time to describe certain amount of ways. So for example, if your audio is describing something like, I don't know, um, she looks down towards the floor, her shoulders are, are slouched. Um, she shakes her, her head from side to side. When you could have just said, she's, she looks sad. And then during that time, you could have spent a lot more time audio, you know, describing a lot of other key information. Um, and the thing is like, a lot of people with visual impairment, they, they felt that the, the objective way of audio description, it was, it was taking them out of the emotive experience because art is subjective. You know, it, it kind of takes you out of that emotional experience because something is being described very blandly like this and it's just giving information. It's a bit more like a science experiment kind of thing, you know, which is fine. But normally within art, art is, you know, emotionally moves us a lot of, a lot of the time. Um, so, yeah. Yes. Yes, Wanda. Yeah, I think um, on that, it's quite it's quite interesting listening to yeah to your process because i can see again i can see how mine's so different as like as an individual artist um so for me so for an example of i guess like exploring the same type of things you're exploring but like the the outcome that i will 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 produce would be really different so for example um there's an exhibition that I've been that I, that I made for a long time and was was shown a lot last year called Distorted Constellations, and I so one of the ideas within it was that there's a there's an ambisonic um, an ambisonic piece of sound art which means it's in you experience it in the you're in the room and it's around you in 360 degrees and the sound moves around you at specific points that's programmed into the, the music and I wanted to give people the experience of my visual perception which is because of this syndrome and um, visual snow it means I see lots of visual effects like I see auras around things I see something that's called star bursting around lights like the light has these big light streams coming out of it I feel disorientation, I, um, I see um, after images of things, which means like, you know, if you look at a light then look at a way you see an after image of the light. So I see after images of everything. So it creates this particular um, visual landscape for me. And I knew when I was writing, so, so one already, I wanted to write a piece of music that described that. So that already gives people who um, can't see, they, they have an, an auditory description, but it's not, it's not a literal description, kind of like in the way you were saying. It's one, it's filtered through my own kind of imaginative experience of how, what is that sonic world. But I think that's not easy for me, but it's kind of a very straightforward concept for me because Although it's predominantly thought of as a visual phenomena, it's not, it's a neurological phenomena for one thing. So it's actually very multi-sensory. So I already have a concept of the visual phenomena being auditory and being tactile and being like very multi-sensory. And actually somebody who came to the exhibition who has synesthesia, um, which so synesthesia is when you have um, a crossing of the senses so you might taste sound or you might hear colour or you might see time and that person um, yeah had synesthesia and he actually he asked me afterwards oh, do you have synesthesia as well because it really felt like I was it, like my experience of the world where I see where I hear light and I see <laughs> Oh, sorry, I'm getting it mixed up. But yeah, I think I, I naturally have, a, have a, a kind of an empathy with that kind of idea that you can use other senses and, and I guess more lateral ways of making things accessible. Um, because I think that's part of the way of how I understand the world. I have to work through quite a lot of different um, 
senses and, and modes of doing things in order to get to, to, to understanding things. Yeah, <laughs> I just wanted to say that. Um, um, can I suggest that we take a few minutes break here because we're about halfway through. So if we say like about three minutes, stretch legs, get a glass of water. Um, and also for everyone else, like have a think if there are questions or comments you have on the conversation and then we can kind of look at some of those when we come back. Yeah. yeah. Great. Three minutes. I'll see you back here. So maybe, uh, I'm not sure, I can't remember, Nathan, what the next questions are, if you have them to hand. Yeah, I can. Okay, so the next three questions were, um, do you feel COVID has put more of a focus on accessibility? Uh, the other questions were, uh, what techniques could artists consider to enhance accessibility within their practice? And the last one was, can accessibility benefit uh, disabled and non-disabled um, artists and audiences simultaneously. So maybe it's good to start with those and um, if you guys are happy to we can you can kind of um, punctuate that with examples does that seem like that would work yeah, sure. yeah. great <laughs> okay should I go first on this one or do you want to go first Wanda? Um, yeah you can go okay all right um, so Within, within, within COVID, um, what, one thing I did notice was obviously because of the nature of COVID, a lot of people were putting a lot more physical information online. So a lot of like, um, you know, a lot of people were having to put a lot of their work on, you know, on, on, online so other people could still access their work. So I guess it meant a lot of people became more, I guess, a little bit more tech savvy or digital savvy within within that context so i guess more people get access to work within that kind of context but in terms of enhancing accessibility for people with disabilities like for audio description there was still a lot of that artistic content that was coming through that was not audio described and so I, you know i decided to see if i could um you know help out where I could within within that context and try and try and fill, fill that gap because that was one thing I was noticed I've seen a lot of content being put up but I was like what about people who are visually impaired you know how are they going to access this dance piece that somebody has put up or you know how are they going to access a lot of the physical information that's going on within you know within this you know image for, for example um so what so what I what I did was I, I started to make I started to make content. I mean, one of the things was obviously within the the midst of COVID, I was I was also mentoring, and I found that when I was mentoring um, people with vision impairment, the sessions didn't really change because of the 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 way in which I'd been audio describing um, and, and and teaching um, those people. It was easy to transfer it. So, for example, there was one young person who was blind. And I was teaching him contact staff. So for those of you that don't know, contact staff is basically a long staff where you're spinning it around and it maintains contact with your body. So you can spin it around your neck, around your shoulders, around your elbows, any part of your body, you can just rotate it and, and spin it. And yeah, so because I was all already teaching him using um, beatboxing sound effects, um, it was just, I was able to teach him, you know, from, you know, from his back garden. So whereas normally when you're teaching physical movement to people with vision impairment, you normally have to give a lot of physical contact, you know, to get them to understand, okay, this, you know, this hand needs to be in this position or this movement needs to happen over there. So because of the technique of um, audio description that we used, it, it lent itself very well to be able to, to express physical movement virtually. Um, also, obviously within the midst of COVID, you also had uh, Black Lives Matter, which, which obviously, you know, kicked off big time. And there was a lot of protest that was happening. Um, and, you know, I actually arranged a, a protest myself as well. And for me, it was really important to make sure that even within the, the, the context of, of the protest, that, that things were accessible. Um, so again, leading up to the protest, I, um, 
I made sure that all of my physical information, whether it be e-flyers, you know, images, um, they were all audio described. And what the good thing about that was a lot of people with visual impairment, and I was also giving people the opportunity if they wanted to, um, you know, to say a, a few words with regards to the protest, those that couldn't access the protest, they, 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 they could. So for example, could like, you know, splice together a, a video that could, that could be shared. And a lot of people with visual impairment said that they really appreciate it because it gave them access to protesting. And a lot of them wanted to be able to, but for example, even certain things like, you know, had, had the, you know, for a lot of protests, you know, where do you know where to go to for the, for the protests a, a lot of the time, you know, do they have somebody that can actually support you there if they want to attend the protest by themselves, you know, can, you know, is there somebody that can actually assist them from getting from A to V? Because what you have to remember is a lot of times with protests, there's a lot of people in a very small space. And, you know, a lot of those people don't even realize that, you know, there's other people who may have a visual impairment around them. So they won't necessarily be mindful of how they'll be moving within that protest. And as we know, within protests, emotions can get quite high. So even like, you know, those things, you know, hadn't, hadn't really beforehand, like, you know, been, been considered. Um, uh, we had a, a BSL interpreter um, at the protest um, on, the, on the day, actually, um, you know, um, inter interpreting what was what was said in all the speeches and things. The, you know, the other thing is for people when they are organising not only protests but just like public events, especially events that are moving or has the potential to move. Um, the the routes on which your march, for example, if it's a protest and we're talking about a march, the route that your march is taking, you know, does it um, is it an accessible route? So, for example, if you have a wheelchair user you know, is it going to be a good idea to have loads of massive hills on this march or like, you know, going across like loads of like cobbled streets and things like that. Um, so it's just like, a, a, you know, a lot, a lot of these things, you know, aren't always considered by um, event organizers and, and, you know, people that are actually doing protests. So, you know, that was one of the ways where we were still trying to embed access in, in everything that we were doing, even within the context of a, of a protest, really. Um, yeah and like we even had like you know some of the some of the audio description was done using wrapping <laughs> you know we were wrapping what the poster looked like um so you know we did we did um, things like that or just um you know talking you know audio describing images with like certain like ambient sound effects so we have this one where there's uh, a skateboarder um you know with a black lives matter um jacket and he's going up a ramp so we described that but we also had the sound effects of um skateboarder like you know skateboarding along and doing jumps and movements and things just so it puts you know it, it puts the listener in in the space a bit more so so we utilize all those kind of techniques really as well so that's what that's what i found within um within covid it kind of enhanced people's access to a, a lot of other people's work in terms of people just putting a lot more things online but again in terms of accessibility for, for disability there's still a lot of work that needs to be done with, with, within that context too. Um, Rando, uh, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, so shall I answer this question and then we've also had a couple of questions come up in the, the chat. Should we do those after this? Um, oh, one of the interesting things that happened um, within a lot of the disabled communities that I'm within was there was, there was these different stages of, of lockdown. For some people at the beginning, um, I don't know if other people relate to this, there was this feeling of like, well, yeah, now you've joined us in <laughs> like lack of not being able to leave your house perhaps, or not being able to do certain things that are just very normal to you. And that's, that's kind of like our lives normally. And so there's some, there's, there are some disabled people who, who definitely felt like, I can cope with this. I know some people with complex PTSD, for example, who are really used to living their lives in a very moment to moment, um, making lots of adaptations and modifications to kind of like keep things on an even keel, suddenly felt like, um, well, the outer world's now reflecting my inner world, which is quite um, an amazing feeling to have. Um, whereas normally, the outer world doesn't reflect that. 
there was also I think there was just a certain amount of increase in empathy amongst people who this was for this was a this was a new experience I mean COVID is a new experience for everybody but yeah there was a sudden understanding of um I, I get asked to go to a lot of meetings and I get asked to, you know, take a train down to London, you know, paying for my own fare, coming for a meeting, for a catch up, you know, things like this. It's like, that's so inaccessible for so many artists, whether that's financially or um, to do with like booking trains and using wheelchairs and I mean there's, there's a plethora of reasons in the way that's inaccessible and there suddenly was an understanding that oh we could have a meeting on a video chat or on the phone and um, so there was some considerations like that there's there's new ones that are coming out which I'm sure site gallery of like gonna need to start thinking about and you're starting to think about in terms of now it's a now it's a video chat and now it's a video meeting how to think about accessibility in terms of, of that um so I, yeah i found out new ways that things weren't accessible like with within video meetings like one of the first ones i had during lockdown was a six hour workshop but it doesn't translate in the same way of well yeah it was anyway it was it made me have a panic attack it was really intense um and so it's yeah and when now the formats are moving there has to be new considerations about accessibility as well um so i think it was um i think it did put more of a focus on accessibility and um and i, and I think in general like i don't think it was a coincidence that the black lives matter stuff really kicked off during lockdown i think in general i felt an increase in empathy an increase in people understanding that things actually just weren't okay before and that if we're gonna change things now's really the time um yeah um shall we should we do some of these questions from the chat yeah yeah let's go for it um what's the first one from um so how accessible do you think big institutions like tate are nowadays so i'm assuming like like tate is just an example but yeah do you want to go for that one okay um i think certain i think you know certain institutional and organizations they're they're stepping you know they're, they're starting to step up but you know there's there's definitely always still room for improvement i remember there was this uh, big inst institution that um we were asked to to do a, a, com a commission on and again like they weren't realistic with the level of accessibility they're wanting mm -hmm. for the, the the budget that they had um for it and things um you know so even like even when we just like for example we're doing the initial consultation and we were looking at the because they want to like a, a tour around their venue like almost like a, a behind the scenes kind of um tour throughout the space and even within like a lot of the a lot of the the routes that they were looking at they were like massive for example like steps you know that that were there and there was a lot of like hazards um that you know that they weren't really putting um, that much thought into okay is this if we are wanting people to go along this route what are we going to have to add for example to the fixtures and fittings or you know in order to make it a safe accessible space um you know for people to be able to tour freely around so for example you'd have some spaces where they'd have like massive like just one massive step like that big and it wasn't even it wasn't appropriate for like wheelchair users to you know, to go through that, just um, to go on that tour, because there was loads of those individual steps all throughout the pay, all throughout the place. And then, you know, when you, you know, make those rec recommendations, or even okay, you know, getting, you know, just some temporary ramps that you could put into that. You know, their their budget wasn't even kind of like extending to that. And so, it was, you know, it was it was it was quite problematic because I remember thinking a, a large organization like yourself, you know, with 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 such a massive turnover that you have, 
you'd think that you'd be able to have like more budget for, for accessibility. Um, and, you know, and I've, I've been, you know, to other organizations and other venues where, you know, they would commission people quite, quite a large amount of money, but their budget for accessibility, again, was like really, really small. And again, so because their, their budget was so small and they weren't, they, they, I don't know if it's a case of they, I find, I find it hard to believe that that is a case of that they couldn't find the funds for it. Um, but if that was the case, then they need to get more creative with their, with their fundraising and, and bid writing, I, I, I feel. Um, so yeah, I, I just think, you know, a lot of these large organizations, you know, they are better than what they were say 10 years ago, but I still think there, there is a ways that they, they can, they, they do need to go in terms of improving, but also I'm also coming from it in terms of making it engaging as well. For me, you know, if you can make accessibility engaging as well and not make that form of access, just be something that's functional to the point where the person who with a disability just don't zones out because it's just not interesting. Yeah, I think, I think there's just loads of interesting points there. And I think, I mean, one thing I was thinking was, um, in my experience from having worked with a few big institutions, I think there's often an assumption that they don't have a disabled audience. And so then why would they proportion a large amount of money to that? They don't realize that they don't have a disabled audience because they're not accessible. And because, yeah, definitely my experience, um, particularly with the last exhibition I did, and also I did a show at the Royal Court last year, which had um, so much engaging, um, uh, like creative captioning and, and a deaf performer who's BSL, um, doing BSL through it. And, you know, just there was just so much kind of, that was really embedded in it. and. Uh, yeah, of course, of course, of course, then you get disabled audiences. It's really, it's like kind of really obvious. Um, because we, we, want, we, want, we want things, we want nice things too. Um, so, I mean, and the other thought I had about it was, so I think, yeah, I think, I think institutions are generally not accessible enough. Um, yes, there's, there's some work done, but, um, and I think, I think it really starts at organisational level. Again, if they, if you have disabled people working in your teams who are supported, then that will filter through. Um, I think that um, there's still this feeling like it's yeah, the, like it's extra money, like it's an imposition, like oh, I have to add this extra time. So it's always this add-on. It's this add-on rather than it's it's kind of integrated. I'm, I've, I've been asked to, to do an exhibition in Australia next year and I'm probably gonna have to turn it down because of the amount of, the amount of compromises I feel like I'd have to make in terms of accessibility because it's, for me, it's, um, it's, 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 it's pretty non-negotiable because I feel really compromised and I feel like the work's really compromised. So in that exhibition, there is, um, I put in the proposal, there's an installation and there's um, a sensory space. They're both part of the creative piece, um, but because it's this, it's described as a sensory room, I've realized people feel like it's an add-on, like an, an optional thing for when, for if there's disabled people, for if there's autistic people, for if there's, and it's not, it's an, it's, um, it's light and shadow, they're, they're both there because the installation is really intense and overwhelming, which is really helpful for, for example, there's been people with fibromyalgia who've been in there, people with multiple complex needs who found it really, really soothing. And there's people like me who find it really <laughs> overwhelming because there's contradictions with accessibility and disability. And the sensory room is for people who find that space overstimulating so they can go there and have this kind of really opposing experience. And I was told that there's not enough room for the sensory room. The other thing is in the sensory room, there's, um, 
there's always two people who are part of my team who are um, um, an accessibility artist is the kind of the role, but the, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's a very creative role. And, and she was always there to talk to people, allow them to experience things. A lot of people would arrive and realize that they had visual snow. A lot of people would arrive and realize that they had something they didn't really had before or just need to talk about it. So that artist was always there. And there's also a researcher who's particularly looking at accessibility who's also always there for people to talk to. Again, these weren't add-ons. These were kind of like birthed at the inception of the project. And they got kind of shaved away and shaved away and shaved away. And then also just my interactions with that organization and how they communicated with me, um, not giving me a contract for six months, expecting me to like do endless meetings online, but still takes a lot of work expecting me to do redesigns because the space kept on changing. It's inaccessible for me. So that's, that's kind of where I've ended up with it. And it's a very big institution. They're actually building a new gallery. These things could have been worked out within it. It's a complicated thing, building a new gallery. But, you know, it's what it is. I, I can't work within that. And so, you know, the less disabled artists are enabled to work within things, the less these kind of things we pointed out and moved on. And, that's slightly my, <laughs> my soap platform for today. Um, but um, can I ask, it was Jamie, wasn't it? Do you, would you like to comment on, on that? And I think that connects back to something that Nathan was saying right at the beginning, that they feel monolithic and impenetrable to so many people um, who are left out of conversations and have historically been really marginalised and still are marginalised. And it sometimes feel like they've done that on purpose. Which yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and as well, like, again, um, following on from what you've been saying, it's it's easy for these big institutions to say we don't have an audience um, for, you know, certain demographics. And it's obvious the reason that is because you haven't really substantially invested in those people. You know, you haven't invested, you know, if you want to, if you want a bigger audience, invest in, you know, finding out what speaks to those audiences, what, you know, what they connect with, what would make the space, you know, less intimidating and more welcoming to them and things like that. You know, what kind of, you know, language would be suitable for certain marketing materials for them? You know, what kind of marketing formats, um, you know, what spaces do they need? What support do they need once they're in the space in that venue? It's like, if, if you truly want to make a, a difference in, in enhancing your audience reach within certain demographics, you, you, you make an investment into those, into, into those audiences. And then, and then they will come, you know, over time they, they, they will come. It can't be just a small, you know, you just throw them small breadcrumbs and then expect, you know, a massive, you know, a massive drove of audiences to come through because it doesn't work like that. Because again, you know, real recognizes real. And we know when something's superficial and we know when something has actually been well thought out and comes from the heart. And, you know, we, we get to see that over time. Um, yeah, and Jamie also said that often maybe people feel they're not represented at all in the space, which is, yeah, exactly what, what Nathan just said. Um, I think, Karen, you had your hand up. Yes, hello. Um, I wanted to add to um, what you were saying, Wanda, about Australia. So uh, I did a show at seem like they they're pretty right on and and thinking about accessibility but we um had a show called clang house and i it was in and i saw where they could put a wheelchair ramp 
and at the beginning of the process they were like oh yeah we'll look into it but we had to keep planning the show and they kept sort of saying yeah yeah we'll, we'll do something and in the end in the 11th hour they're like oh we haven't got a budget and so we were we had to do the show without it being accessible and that felt really terrible so there's there's that thing of you can be led along um which is difficult but i just wanted to pick up on something nathan said um i was at a conference and this uh wheelchair user she was saying make your venue accessible to me and i will come and come and come to your shows she said i want to go out and I will go to the places that su that support me and, and and allow me to come in. So I think it is in every venue's uh, best interest to look after, you know, these accessibility. And it's not obviously it's not just mobility. Um, it's you know it's all sorts of stuff. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. I saw I saw that piece. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> and I think what you've said also picks connects to a question that David put in the chat, which is about the responsibility of the organisations around accessibility and, it and, and if it should be more on them to ensure the artist's practice is accessible or is it like a joint responsibility? And, and you picked up on a point where, in fact, you, you were trying to make it accessible, but the organisation, the institution wasn't really doing their bit and taking it seriously enough and left you in a position where you felt really compromised because you do feel responsible as the artist and and i i mean i yeah speaking for myself and it sounds like you did as well i, I feel really responsible and i feel really emotional about it um i i once had somebody uh turn up to something in in a wheelchair and they'd gotten a, they'd driven across the country and in the marketing material, there was there was meant to be a lift where they could see the see the piece, and the lift actually wasn't fit for purpose for the current wheelchairs. Um, and I remember, I remember just standing outside the exhibition and talking to them for half an hour and just feeling really really shit and just I'm so trying to make it better and I can't make it better and um, I think that too much I think my in my experience a lot of um, a lot of the impetus and weight has been, I felt, has been put on me as the artist with the piece, rather than the institution taking responsibility and saying, okay, what do you need to make this accessible? It's me, it's been me saying, really to make sure that there's 1.5 metres for wheelchairs, need to make sure that there's a quiet space and a dark space, need to make sure that there's BSL interpretation, no, don't run out of, don't say there's no more budget because I said that, you know, it was from the start. You told me that this is going to be fully accessible. These are the things. Um, and the fact that I'm have to having to argue for that adds on to that whole weight of being the artist and being the freelancer, not being salaried and having to be the one who's, who's doing, that's an additional role. That's called consultation. And I know that's better paid than what I'm being paid. <laughs> And um, yeah, so like artists having to be, artists yeah, shouldn't be consultants on this unless they're being employed as that. Um, so I think that the weight of the burden of responsibility shouldn't be on the artists because we end up really, yeah, taking it really personally. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think the majority of the weight needs to be on the institution and the organisation. And that is because if they're wanting the artist to perform in that space, they need to be able, just like how, for example, if they want to give a performer a, like space to perform, you know, if they're not given space, they can't hold their performance within that organization. This is, this is no different. You know, it's, it's something that's integral to, you know, to, to the performance so everybody can access it. So the organizations and institutions need to be able to provide all of that you know, and to be in dialogue with the artist right from them, right from the collaboration, right from the outset. So they can say, okay, what access requirements do you have for your show? This is what we have in place. If we don't have what we need in place, tell us what we need in order to make it happen. And they should not expect an artist to still put their show there and to have to compromise the accessibility to, to do that. It should be a case of, they they should they should find a way 
because the thing is that's going to help that's going to help them in the long run anyway for all of you know all other works that they that they put on in, in that space because you know it'll just help make all other works accessible because there'll be certain elements that you may bring to the table that is accessible that they could actually incorporate in future you know in future works that, that come to that venue so and again it's an investment and you know and the thing is it's like if you know they have an artist that hasn't you know considered accessibility then again you know the institution organization can start to put that on their radar because then what can then happen is if they don't for example have an accessible performance for that time round or that piece work that time around it's on their radar that okay next time you come we would like for you to to make it accessible if possible in ways so then we're we're starting to bridge gaps and you know we're we're all we're all doing our, our our you know our bit to you know to make things accessible for everybody. But I feel at the moment there's more weight on the artists than there is on the institutions. And for me, that's a bit of a cop. Well, that's a massive cop out if I'm if I'm being honest. Um, yeah. um, we've just about we've hit half past one, which is when we said that we'll finish. So I don't want to kind of push anyone over. I don't know if one day. Nathan, if you have any final things that you want to add that we haven't covered? Yeah, I just wanted to, I've got, I've got a few links that I'm just going to share with everybody, um, um, which are really useful, like Unlimited and The Space are both really great and have lots of toolkits. Um, yeah, again, I think, I think, it's, it's really useful for artists. Again, I think it should be institutions because all the information's out there online and, and they should be like accessing these predominantly, but it's useful as well for artists, um, particularly the inclusive design principles. I tried to read through it actually today and I found it a little bit impenetrable, but um, which is ironic. But um, yeah, just, no, just, yeah, just wanted to say um, thank you and um, yeah, happy to um, be contacted if you want to talk more about anything for anybody and or um, um or you have more questions um or if you're disabled and want to be put in touch with people like unlimited in the space I, I can directly contact you with them if you need help with that awesome thank you nathan um yeah i, I just want to say you know for, for anybody thinking about accessibility super important to you know to to consult um, with with people that you're trying to access. So if you want to, you know, focus on audio description, you know, talk to people, you know, who are visually impaired or who are blind. You know, if you want to, you know, make things accessible for for deaf audiences, you know, do do the same. Really, don't hypothesize. You know, actually get you know get it straight from the horse's mouth, or you know work with people that have that experience that have those at that access to those those organizations because there will be people that you know that have the access to those communities and like i say the more you can um, work with those communities the more the more accessible your work would be you know because at the end of the day it's the people that are going to be coming to watch your show so uh, yeah work with the people when you're making your show um so yeah that's um that's what i would say um if anybody um you know, has any more questions, um, again, regarding accessibility, um, I'm more than, I'm more than happy to answer those questions and things. I think you can share our, our, our details, um, on, on here and things. Um, so yeah, more, more, more than happy to, to help wherever possible, but yeah, I just want to say thank you so much, um, for, you know, providing this space for us to have this conversation, really appreciate it. And, um, yeah, hopefully, uh, be able to see you guys soon. Great. Um, Thank you so much, Wando and Nathan. That was really, really great. And I know from um, Site's point of view, it's it's really interesting and it's really great to hear all of that. We're aware, as always, with lots of things, we have a lot of work to do. So it's, um, for us, it's really useful. It's really good to hear from you both. And um, I think this will be a good point to spur on some more change. Um, I will, if anyone has other questions or things they want to pass on, if you um, email site, then we can put you in touch or pass things on to Wanda and Nathan. Um, yeah, and look forward to continuing the conversation beyond this.
That'd be great. Um, thank you so much to everyone. I will see you all soon. Cheers. Yeah.